When searching through articles ranking FNAF fan games, you will always see one game listed either at the top or very close to it. That game is the Joy of Creation Story Mode, one of the most highly praised FNAF fan games in the community. Many people like it for its insanely good visuals, while others think the gameplay is what shines the most. This one person even said that the game had their hand shaking the entire time they were playing. So you'd expect me to have played this game, right? You know, being a FNAF YouTuber and all? Well, surprisingly, no, I still haven't got around to it. But I decided to change that today. So join me as I do a deep dive into the Joy of Creation story mode, to see if it really is as good as people say. But before that, I want to thank today's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Surfshark VPN helps you keep your online identity safe by encrypting all of the information sent between your devices and the internet, keeping your personal data protected from big companies and cyber criminals. Surfshark also lets you change your IP to different locations, allowing you to virtually travel to any country. So how does this help you exactly? Well, firstly it allows you to bypass censorship everywhere. For example, say I want to watch a YouTube video that's been banned in my country. I can simply load up Surfshark VPN and change my location to a country the video is available in. My favorite thing about Surfshark though is how it secures your online data. Do you ever get worried you may get a virus when and downloading obscure FNAF fan games? Well, I sure have many times, but not anymore. Thanks to Surfshark's clean web feature, which blocks ads, trackers, malware, and phishing attempts, I'm able to browse the internet with the peace of mind that I'm being protected. This applies to my phone as well, thanks to Surfshark working on an unlimited amount of devices with no restrictions. If you're interested in trying Surfshark VPN out for yourself, make sure you use code PLANETRACE to get 83% off, as well as 3 extra months for free. Surfshark even offers a 30 day money back guarantee, so there's really no risk in trying it out. You can find a link to Surfshark VPN in the description below. Once again, thank you Surfshark for sponsoring this video. This video is going to be split into three chapters. I'm first going to talk about the game's five levels while giving my thoughts on each one, and then after that I'll talk about the game's story which unfolds through many cutscenes seen between stages, and lastly I'll talk about the game's graphics, controls, and just overall presentation. So without further ado, let's begin with Memory 1. In our very first memory of the game, we play as Nick when he was a child. We are in our dark bedroom under our crib when we get a call from our brother Michael. Michael tells us there are monsters trying to kill us and then he gives us a rundown on how to survive from them. Freddy will come to the window. You will know he is there when you see his arm against the glass, which means you will need to hold the curtain shut until he goes away which will be indicated to you through a sound cue. Chica will every once in a while peek her head through the closet door, and to avoid dying to her, you must shut off your lamp and make sure you don't sleep. Bonnie will bang on your door before peeking his head in. Failing to hide behind the crib before Bonnie enters the room will result in him doing this. Finally, Foxy will begin scratching behind your bed, indicating that he is in his first movement phase. After moving one more time, Foxy's hook will be able to be seen behind your crib. This means that the next time Foxy moves, he will be standing right in front of the window, blocking you from closing the curtains. To get rid of Foxy, you will need to close your eyes and sleep, which will cause him to crawl back under your bed. There is something so terrifying about the idea of Foxy crawling back under your bed, waiting for another time to try and kill you. Also, the visual of him standing above your crib is just so terrifying to me. We also have something kind of similar to a power meter, which is called our sanity. Our sanity drains every time we have the lamp turned off, and every time we look at one of the animatronics directly. This means that we need to conserve as much lamp time as possible, as well as trying to avoid eye contact with the animatronics at all costs. At first, I thought this night was very frustrating and unfair, but now that I have gotten the hang of the gameplay, I can see how well thought out and expertly crafted this night actually is. Now it sounds very simple on paper, however when the animatronics gimmicks begin to overlap, that is where the gameplay really shines in my opinion. For example, there are so many times where you will see Freddy's arm at the window, but also hear Bonnie's knocking at the door. 
and we'll have to decide to either stick to closing the curtains or to try to quickly hide from Bonnie before Freddy gets in. It's moments like these in particular that add so much tension to the night. I can't stress enough how many times I would be holding the curtains closed, hoping that the other animatronics would just give me a few extra seconds before killing me. To add to the already stressful night as well, while losing your sanity, the screen starts to become less clear and your hearing also becomes more limited. This makes you focus extra hard to hear every single sound effect and adds a whole new challenge to the already tough gameplay. That's all not to mention that this night is 10 minutes long. I'm not joking, it's literally 10 minutes. So those attempts where I made it 9 minutes in had my heart absolutely pounding because I did not want to get reset back to the start. This isn't even the most stressful of the nights though. Night 5 really made me understand what that guy meant when he said the game had him shaking. Let me not get too far ahead of myself though. Overall, I thought the first night of this game was one of the best FNAF gameplay loops I have ever played. Everything just felt perfectly thought out and it was able to stay tense the entire time. The only real thing I thought was done poorly was how the mechanics were explained. They don't really explain the sanity meter to you at all and kind of just expect you to learn through trial and error, which can be very time consuming due to how long the night actually was. I would still rate it an 8 out of 10 though because boy did it feel good to beat this one. In Night 2, or Memory 2, we play as Scott's wife, and this one takes place in the living room. In this one, we once again need to survive against Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy, however, the gameplay in this one is completely different. We can now fully roam around the room. This room has a main TV, a door to the left and right, and a middle doorway with a keyhole which you can look through. Freddy and Foxy will make their way towards the right and left doors, and when you know one of them is about to burst in, you must hide on the side of the wall that the door is on, to avoid their line of sight. You can monitor both Freddy and Foxy by sitting on the couch and watching the TV. Here you will also see headcams of both of them walking towards the door, and there is also a pause button. As long as you are holding this button, the animatronic you are watching will stop walking. You must use this mechanic to manipulate when each of the animatronics will come to the door in order to prevent more than one coming in at the same time. While sitting on this couch, you may also sometimes hear growling behind you. That means that Chica is attacking. To avoid her from killing you, you just need to stand up and stay completely still. Now finally for Bonnie. Bonnie will make his way closer and closer to the middle door with 5 stages. First starting in the back of the hallway, and then moving closer each phase until he eventually reaches the keyhole and you can see his eye shining through it. This happens right before Bonnie opens the door and scans the room which requires you to hide against the wall with his door on it. To avoid Bonnie coming in at the same time as Freddy and Foxy, you need to listen for the sound cue which plays every single time Bonnie moves, and take that into consideration when choosing the times Freddy and Foxy will come in. This whole night is extremely chaotic and requires you to trust your gut a lot to make it through. This night is also 10 minutes long and once again features intense visuals that had my heart racing towards the end of the night. This night has a perfect gameplay system that much like the first one doesn't feel linear or scripted at all. You have full control of how everything unfolds during the night and it is up to you to manipulate everything accordingly in order to win. This is yet again another fantastic night that I honestly wouldn't change anything about. Funnily enough, the only criticism I have for this night is the same as the last. Things just aren't explained thoroughly enough. You have no idea about the 5 phases Bonnie moves through unless you look up a guide, which I'm not gonna lie I had to do because I could not sit there and trial and error over and over during this 10 minute night. Overall, this night gets a 9 out of 10 for me. I honestly think it's a little better than the first one. For Memory 3, we play as Scott for probably the easiest level in the game, and this one is placed inside of an office. There is a door in front of us, a door to our left, and a window to our right. And by pressing space on this setup, we are allowed to check the monitors. This shows us cameras of our left door, middle door, and window. In this night, we need to go around the different doors flashing our lights on Freddy, who we need to flash 10 times before we reach 6am to win the stage. While trying to do this, we again must deal with Foxy, Bonnie, and Chica. 
Foxy will randomly appear in one of the doorways, and if we go to flash that specific doorway while Foxy is in it, he will kill us. We can get rid of Foxy by going to the monitors and staring at him until he goes away. Failing to get rid of Foxy fast enough will also get us killed. Bonnie works kind of the opposite way from Foxy. If you see Bonnie when checking any of the doorways, then keep that in mind and make sure you don't check on Bonnie in the cameras as spotting Bonnie on the cameras will actually result in him breaking that camera, and it will never come back for the rest of the night. Last but not least, we have Chica, who randomly a few times during the night will appear inside of this wall. Chica will slowly begin crawling out of this wall, and it is our job to stop her from getting out. We can do this by keeping an eye on her as much as possible, which will slow how fast she can crawl out. While doing this, we also must find three cupcakes around the room, as doing so will make her disappear. These can be found in all types of places, like trash cans, behind posters, and even out in the hallways. There is an audio cue paired with every single cupcake, however, they can still be a nuisance, as you must make sure Foxy isn't in the hallway you're trying to check. Now, while there isn't anything inherently wrong with this night, I just felt that it was a little boring compared to the other ones. To me, this one felt far too easy and also felt very safe most of the time. Foxy is just not hard to deal with at all, and while Chica's cupcake hunt is really cool, it isn't very hard either. So it leads to this just being a chill kind of night. Which, honestly, for a fan game as hard as this one, isn't necessarily a bad thing, as nights 4 and 5 get extremely difficult. My final rating for Memory 3 is a 7 out of 10, still above average for FNAF fan game gameplay. With the really cool moments like the animations when you flash your light on Freddy, or the visual of Chica coming out of the wall, I just couldn't go any lower with the score. But I still wanted it to be lower than Memories 1 and 2, as this one just did not match those, in terms of its tension. Yo, what's up guys? So I quickly just wanted to jump in here while editing to say that we are almost at 100,000 subscribers, which is absolutely insane. So if you guys are enjoying the video, please consider subscribing to help me reach that goal. Anyways, with that being said, let's get back to the video. For night 4, we keep playing as Scott, only this time we are in the basement. This memory spawns us on the 6th floor, with each floor having a different puzzle we need to solve in order to escape. Some of these puzzles were actually really tough to get through, but luckily we get a checkpoint after every floor. For floor 6, we need to exit the bathroom we spawn in and make our way over to this locked doorway. After attempting to open it, we get a hallucination which tells us to go back. After that, we just need to make our way back to the bathroom while trying to avoid this endo that's standing in the corner. To avoid this type of endo, we must stay as far away from it as possible. So in this floor's case, we just need to hug the wall until we make it to the bathroom, and we are good. After that, we are taken to floor 5. In this one, we need to find an item belonging to each of the four characters that are hidden in the room. After finding these items, we must place them in the furnace, however, there are three threats hiding everywhere. For example, when collecting Chica's cupcake from the poster, we must stop and listen until we no longer hear growling before grabbing it. We also need to make sure we don't open the locker next to the one housing Bonnie's guitar, as if we do so, an endo will kill us. This endo jump scare got me extremely bad when I was first playing. I did not expect him to jump out of the locker like that, and it caught me off guard extremely bad. After burning all of the items, we can safely return back to the bathroom, which brings us to floor 4. For floor 4, we need to make our way out of the bathroom and solve a pretty simple code on the wall by looking at some posters. After this, a gate opens up and behind it is another endo, except this one is a little different, behaving more like a weeping angel. Anyways, we need to turn around to lure the endo as close as possible to us before making our way around him. Before going through the gate though, we can press the button once again which traps the endo on the other side. From here, we just need to do one more puzzle involving some more posters, which opens a gate revealing a key. We can then take this key back to the bathroom and move down to floor 3, which is the easiest of them all. You literally just walk down a hallway and don't look behind you. I beat this one first try, so I'm not even sure if you can die at this one, but I'm guessing you can. Floor 2, which is probably the most frustrating of them all, we need to come out of the bathroom and we will see text flashing on these monitors. After this, a gate opens up revealing two more Weeping Angel Endos. 
We need to lure these endos into our room and once again make our way around them to go the way they came from. While still staring at them, we need to walk backwards down the hallway while avoiding endos standing to our left and right. After reaching the back of the hall, we can then press a button on the wall which opens up a gate housing one final weeping angel endo. We once again need to lure him away from the door while also not dying to the other endos in order to climb the stairs and interact with the door one final time. After this, all of the endos disappear and we can safely return to the bathroom, which takes us to floor 1, concluding memory 4. This level was a lot of trial and error and was very frustrating at times. For me, floor 2 was especially hard when you had to lead the endo out of the gate without getting killed. This night's more escape room nature was a nice change of pace from the survive 10 minutes mechanic each of the prior memories had, however I just can't say I enjoyed it as much as the first two memories. The deaths in this one sometimes felt more annoying than punishing and with the long cutscenes between every attempt I found myself getting more frustrated than anything on this one. So my rating for memory 4 is a 6 out of 10. Alright, so now for the fifth and final memory, which actually happens to not only be the hardest, but also my favorite night in the entire game. This one is going to be a little confusing to explain I'm pretty sure, so just bear with me. So in front of us is a computer screen, and on this screen we can monitor two animatronics, Creation and Golden Freddy. Golden Freddy cannot kill us if we don't shock him, however the only way to beat the knight is to eventually shock him 13 times. Creation however can actually kill us. Every few seconds Creation will move forward one space, and we must keep track of Creation and use our shock on on him by pressing the lever to the right in order to reset his position every time he moves. If we are too slow to reset Creation's movement, he will break the barricade in front of him and move one floor closer to killing us. The lever that shocks the animatronics needs a lot of time to recharge and is also the one we need to use to shock Golden Freddy. While attempting to balance shocking both of those animatronics, we also need to worry about three different endos. By pressing space, we are able to look behind us, which reveals two doors. Each has a lever to close, however only one can be closed at a time. If we turn back around and pull the green lever to the left, we can see two cameras. These cameras show us if there is an animatronic outside one of the doors behind us. If an animatronic is there, we need to close the door. However, it can get a little confusing as when it says right door on the monitor, it is actually to your left when you turn around. The third endo attacks you by randomly running towards you various times during the night. Every once in a while, you will hear running from one of your sides, which means you need to close that side's door as soon as possible. If both of the animatronics are at the other doors, this requires you to plan out your defense perfectly. Say an animatronic is in the left and right door, and the running one is coming from the right side. I would have to close the right door, and as soon as I heard the animatronic hit the door, I would need to check the left door's camera feed. If I see the left animatronic move immediately, I need to turn around and close the left door, and then the right one after. However, if the right animatronic goes first, I will simply hear him bang on the door and then I can close the left one. It's this in-depth defense gameplay that makes this the best night the game has to offer in my opinion. Trying to analyze the endo's positions in order to plan out how you will stop them from killing you despite the fact that you can only close one door at a time while also juggling your other responsibilities makes this such an engaging final night. The entire time you are playing this night, you are constantly analyzing where the animatronics will be, planning for your next move, and executing different movements to keep yourself alive. The whole thing is just so satisfying when you are the one in control, and despite this night taking me multiple hours to beat, I never really got frustrated at it. Every loss I understood where I messed up and was ready to jump back in for another attempt. I also don't know if I have ever felt tension like the last few moments of this fifth night. The drowned out noise and loud fire made me think that the endo was going to run through my doorway at any moment. This last section had my heart absolutely pounding, and this is what I was talking about earlier when I said I found out the reason that commenter's hand was shaking. I am not joking when I say that this night is a 10 out of 10 in my opinion, and also the night that solidified this as my new favorite FNAF fan game. So yes, first it was Fred Bear and Friends, then the glitched attraction, and now the joy of creation has taken the spot for my favorite FNAF fan game.
Now the actual story aspect of the Joy of Creation story mode is where the game lost me. This game's story is very meta, taking place in our world where FNAF is just a game series made by Scott Cawthon. Over the span of the game's five levels, we see Scott Cawthon and his family being tormented by the animatronics Scott created, along with Michael Afton, who even thanks Scott for bringing him into this world towards the end of the game. Each level has you playing as a member of Scott's family, with the story eventually concluding with I'm pretty sure Michael Afton taking over Scott's body. Now I'm pretty sure that this story isn't meant to be taken too seriously and is just a fun thing to connect the levels together, however I didn't really find it that interesting if I'm being completely honest, and kind of just saw it as filler between the expertly crafted gameplay sections. Now that is not to say that it is not presented in an amazing fashion. There are beautifully animated cutscenes along with voice acting for every single character which makes this game's story much easier to follow than other FNAF fan games. In my opinion you will most likely be going into the Joy of Creation story mode funnily enough not for the story but for the actual gameplay and visuals. So if I'm judging it based on that then I would say that the story did a decent job of keeping me curious on what would happen next but I still think that it could have been done a little bit better. Everything just seemed to be happening randomly and at no point was I ever able to predict what would happen next. I would say that this story is passable, but just not anything too interesting. As for the graphics and presentation of the game, I think that is where it really shines. Now obviously the graphics and models for this game are absolutely amazing. The fidelity of this game as well as just how good it looks thanks to the Unreal Engine takes this game to a level I have never seen another fan game top. The use of Unreal Engine also allows this game to set up horrifying scares that wouldn't be possible in other fan games. For example, when Freddy gets through your window in night 1, you will have to physically turn around to see him standing behind you before he kills you. This adds a whole other layer to the idea of a jump scare and honestly makes it way scarier than if Freddy just popped up after getting through the window. Another great example of this is the red endos you need to stay away from. The speed in which these guys turn around and run towards you if you get too close is honestly one of the scariest things in the game in my opinion. I jumped several times when I was not expecting one of them to just spring towards me so fast. I know that this is very cliche, but it's really the truth. This is not only the best looking FNAF fan game in my opinion, but the best looking FNAF game in general. The visual effects and dark atmosphere of everything makes this game feel a lot more immersive than Security Breach, which a lot of the time felt bland and soulless in my opinion. The first person camera angles were also done perfectly. I love how on the nights that use cameras, you have to press space to lock yourself in a position where you can watch these cameras, because this separates the seated and free roaming sections perfectly and prevents either one of them from feeling janky because they need to compensate for the other's mechanics. Everything about this game's visuals, presentation, and controls were done flawlessly in my opinion, and I seriously wouldn't change anything about them. So yeah, that concludes my look into the Joy of Creation story mode. It all makes sense to me now why everyone on my Glitched Attraction video was claiming that this is the best FNAF fan game. For some reason, I always thought that it was just the most generic pick and that it couldn't actually be that good. I assumed that everyone was just saying that because of the game's amazing visuals and nothing more. But that couldn't be further from the truth. Nights like the first one and especially the final one proved to me that the Joy of Creation story mode boasts some of the most engaging, tension-filled gameplay you can find in the genre. And I think that this game is a must-play for anyone who hasn't checked it out yet. It does take some time to get adjusted to the mechanics and the difficulty, but just trust me, the feeling of completing some of these nights is the best I've felt playing a horror game in a long time. Let me know down below what your favorite aspect of the game was. Anyways, that is it from me. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all in the next one. Peace.